Good to see you, brother. How you doing, man? One of the biggest benefits of MIGS is a drop burden reduction. Less chemicals, less preservatives, less cost, less stress. Oh my God. What they taught me in school is really happening. TM is like tissue paper. I track cath is gonna go in the canal beautifully. So just hold it there. See, there's no other device in the market that can go 360 with one pass. That blew my mind. This is the biggest change in my practice. I see in your movements, it's like oh, you're I on the, the keyboard again, again, you know? Like, with, I gotta write another song now, man. I'm gonna go back to my hotel room now <laughs> and jam. You write a song about this? I'm you know I am. <laughs> All right, hey, I could be your songwriter. Let's do it, man, let's do something. <laughs>
I don't know if you call that more ergonomic, but it sounds just more chill overall. Oh, it's so much more chill. I mean, it's great. Now that the initial, I think once you got the hang of the initial, an earlier version, yeah. it wasn't that bad, honestly. Yeah. But I think, yes, I think for newer surgeons who are not used to that manual way, I think this is going to make it a lot easier. Plus, they actually changed the actual uh, the actual catheter itself. They made a nitinol internal internal uh, substance to allow it to be more stable, so that way it can go 360. There's no other device in the market that has the same kind of loading device that can go 360 with one pass. Okay. That's really cool. All right, so one of the common complaints with MIGS is the learning curve. And I'm just wondering if you think iTrack Advance accelerates the learning curve of canalplasty a bit further beyond what we've talked about already. I think the key to any, any MIGS you do, I don't care what it is, the view. So I think the key to any person who's looking at getting into MIGS, take your time to understand how to get a good view, how much viscoelastic to put in the eye, how much pressure to put on the cornea with your gonio prism. Getting used to that non-dominant hand holding the gonio prism on the cornea. Doing like going to cataract surgery. Doing your cataract, you take the lens out, you put the new lens in the eye before you finish, turn the head in the scope, just practice, take a, a Sinsky or something and work in the angle just to get the comfort level. Once you get that technique down and get a good view and you can maintain a good view, then this is very straightforward. And what's nice about about the iTrack catheter and with the advance is once you engage the TM, right, you don't want you don't want to push too hard. You just gotta keep it there, gentle pressure, and just leave it there. So I think for some surgeons who don't want to actually move their hand a lot, just want to sit there and let it do its magic, just sit there and advance this catheter. So I think for a lot of surgeons, it's a great way to get involved with MIGS. Number two is you have that blinking red light. So you know exactly where you are. So let's say hypothetically, you go in the canal and you're like, wait a minute, that light's going somewhere, I don't know where it's going. Just back up. You have clear evidence of where you are. I think some of the uncertainty is what makes people not want to do MIGs because they don't know what's happening. Right. Here you would see exactly what's happening and you can titrate it. So let's say you just go 180 and you're like, I'm getting resistance, I want to stop. Okay, you can stop at 180. So it gives you the flexibility to do as much or as little as you want, but yet without having to worry about a stent to go on the eye. But it's also very consistent with other type of MIGs procedures, so the skill set is similar to other MIGs procedures as well. Now, Paul, when it comes to treatment selection for your glaucoma patients, I know you're a big advocate for patient quality of life. So what are the factors contributing to higher quality of life for a glaucoma patient? Man, I tell you, this is the biggest change in my practice. Yeah. And what is my definition of control glaucoma, right? Okay. It used to be, hey man, your nerve's fine, I don't care how you feel, I don't care how bad the dry eyes are, I don't care how much you can't afford your meds, your pressures are good, see ya, bye-bye, right? That was how I used to be. But now you realize the drop burden is difficult. And we have enough data out there in the MIGS world with stenting, with other procedures, with light trial, with SLT, right. showing us that drops themselves not only affect quality of life, they increase costs, they cause dry eye, mobobian gland dysfunction, but there's peaks and troughs. Lack of compliance causes fluctuating IOP, which can lead to progression. Right. So for me, one of the biggest barriers is just really keeping people on medication. So what's changed in my philosophy, one of the biggest benefits of MIGS is a drop burden reduction. Even if the pressure is a couple points higher after MIGS, give example, someone's on three medications, pressure's 13. You do a MIGS procedure, they're on one medication, but their pressure's 15. Guess what? That's success to me. So even if it's a couple points higher even, getting rid of the medication is a big part of my definition. I think that is what the big benefit is for our patients because they're able to maintain, even if they're back on one med, a better chance of maintaining that drop, not affecting their quality of life as much, cost and side effects. And I think that to me is the biggest change that I've seen philosophically. What is my definition of control glaucoma? Man, I feel like you're really jazzed up about this. I see in your movements, it's like oh, you're on the keyboard song. again, yeah, you know? I'm, like, I'm writing a daisy. But you know, I gotta write another song now, man. I'm gonna go back to my hotel room now. <laughs> you gotta write a song about this? I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna, you know I am. <laughs> All right, hey, I could be your songwriter. Let's do it, man, let's do something. So how does canaloplasty enable you to balance the need for IOP control as well as patient quality of life? Patient quality of life is, to me, yeah. tied directly to drop burden reduction, right? And we also know, of course, when you have glaucoma damage, we lose contrast, et cetera, but it's really the drops that cause the quality of life to be decreased. So we don't have to wait till someone has advanced glaucoma on four medications, then do a surgery. We can take a patient on one medication who's having a hard time and address it earlier when our target pressures are not as low where something like this could get us to that target pressure, get them off that medication. What are you doing when you get them off that one med? Number one, less chemicals, less preservatives, less cost, less stress. You know how many people stress at night saying, I can't remember that drop at night. I've had family members say, thank you for getting off of one med because they had to go to their daughter, their mother's health to put a drop in their eye 20 minutes away because their mother couldn't do it by themselves. So there's so many reasons why we can positively affect someone's quality of life and doing it even as a standalone or at the time of cataract surgery. How beautiful is that? You take out the cataract, they're happy because they can see better because of quality of vision. And at the same time, if you can reduce their drop burden, 
it's a double, double, double whammy. All right, so it sounds like quality of life is a big factor in the decision to go with the canaloplasty. When you consider all the different MIGS procedures that you offer your patients, where's the sweet spot for the eye track advance in your practice? I think the sweet spot is number one, as for sure, as a standalone. I think you have an earlier mild to moderate patient, even a fake patient, right? My goal is to not remove TM, not disrupt it as much as possible. I think there is something to be said about the natural physiology of the eye, right? Talk about mechanism. Yeah. You know, Stegman and Johnstone have done some great work showing us there's a, there's a pump mechanism of the trabecular meshwork. Hmm. If we can maintain that pump mechanism, we have a better chance, I think, in some ways, of being more physiologic with how we approach glaucoma. So if I have an earlier mild to moderate patient, let's say even fake 50, 60 year old patient, on one or two meds, go ahead and do this procedure. You're not destroying tissue. You can go ahead and do SLT afterwards if you want. You can go ahead and do another glaucoma surgery, like stenting later on if you need to. So that's our sweet spot, that mild to moderate patient early on. Now they're pseudophagic. Yeah. They've already had cataract surgery in the United States. We still don't have, except for recently with the eye stent infinite, right. we haven't had a great ability to put stenting in the eye, right? Well, here you have an opportunity. If someone's pseudophagic, they already had cataract surgery, and they're on two or three medications, they'll say mild to moderate, why not go in there, reopen the drain, get them off of one or two medications, Ooh. and help impress, improve their quality of life. So I think that's a great sweet spot. And number two is a combination. In the United States, I do a lot of combo, yeah. viscodilating, right? Flushing the system out, removing those herniations, and then putting those stents, whether it's the eye stent or hydrus, whatever stent it is, kind of combining mechanisms with stenting as well as viscodelivery and canaloplasty as well. So that combination has worked really well for us as well. Some believe that, you know, because canaloplasty doesn't leave a permanent implant, nor does it remove or tear tissue, that it's not as effective and long lasting as other MIGS procedures. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? No, I mean, it's, it's a good question. I think it's a real cool question because we need long data, all long term data. Yeah. But we actually have three year good data. Mark Gallardo, a good friend of mine in the United States, Mahmoud Kiami, both wonderful surgeons who've done a number of pro, uh, eye track catheters for many years now, have great published data showing us longevity. Yeah. And in fact, their pressures are being down to the 13, 14 range, starting pressures in the low 20s on three, two and a half to three meds, down to less than a med. Mm -hmm. So we have great long term data now showing pure canaloplasty. We can get patients down on less meds and down to the middle to lower teens, a lot of patients. I think the difference is not all canaloplasty is the same. There's a variability in how much viscoelastic people put in, how much force is being pushed in with different products out there as well. I think what's nice about the eye track is you can push as much viscoelastic, be more aggressive in some people using different viscoelastic types. So I think we have the ability, again, to titrate based upon severity level as well. Could you give me some details, Paul, about the results on the intraoperative OCT that you performed on patients during canaloplasty using the eye track? Yeah, that, that blew my mind. So look, we, we all understand that um, there's some question mark as what is really happening. You know, we theoretically know that the eye track catheter is breaking those herniations in the canal and flushing the system up. But are we really stretching open TM? Are we really viscodilating the canal? And what's happening to the distal collector channels? Are they opening up? Well, I'll tell you what blew my mind yeah. was I have luckily in my own office, we have an in-office surgical suite, right? And we have the Artiva, which is a an, uh, eye rescan, which is a 3D heads up with intraoperative OCT. I have a few case series of patients where we have the catheter through the canal. We imaged live while we were removing the catheter, it was already in the canal. Yeah. We were watching, we were scanning as the catheter was going past that area, what was happening to the canal as we were pushing viscoelastic. And what blew my mind was as we were clicking the viscoelastic, you could see clearly on the OCT, the canal literally go whoop, and then the TM stretching, and then all of a sudden these squiggly lines, which are the collector channels, getting wider and bigger. So not only did it show us clinically with these blanching that we always talk about, we have real-time intraoperative OCT evidence that we are addressing truly the TM, the canal, and the distal collector channels. And we were seeing it for the first time with intraoperative OCT blew my mind. It was like, wow, this is really happening. Well, it ain't your father's peer-reviewed journal article. I mean, to be able to witness something like that. It was, it was cool. It was really cool to see that as well. Paul Singh, that is good stuff. And for sure, it sounds like the eye track is taking canaloplasty to the next level, really demystifying what's really game-changing procedure. Um, Got to say thanks for your time here, man. It's been awesome. I love this, man. I get to hang out with Matt. This Hell is awesome. Yeah. Bro. Matt, yeah, man. Thanks. Oh, that was good. Thanks, everybody. There Appreciate we go. It. APAO Thank you. 2023. Woo. Awesome. That was awesome.